This message is brought to you by DoNotAge.org, the longevity research organisation that's on a mission to extend health span for as many people as possible via products that actually work. Start your journey today at DoNotAge.org and use code LAMA for a 10% discount. That's L-L-A-M-A. We have to start to prepare our species to the social acceptance of living longer. One of the most important things for me is the quality of life. It's not only the time, you know, how much, but can you live with a great quality for 80 years? Hello and welcome to the Live Long and Master Aging podcast. I'm Peter Bowes. This is where we explore the science and stories behind human longevity. Now, for this and more episodes over the next few months, I'm happy to announce that the Llama podcast is joining forces with Amazentis, a Swiss life science company that's pioneering cutting-edge, clinically validated cellular nutrition under its Timeline brand. This will be a partnership for a series of episodes exploring the research behind cellular nutrition, why it matters for our longevity, and also finding out more about the scientists making it happen. Today I'm joined by Professor Patrick Ebisher, the chairman and co-founder of Amazentis. Patrick is a medical doctor and a neuroscientist, a long-time researcher and author. Dr. Ebisher, welcome to the Live Long and Master Aging podcast. Hello. Good to be here with you. It's very good to talk to you. We're all living, aren't we, through extremely uncertain times at the moment, trying to move forward with whatever it is we do the best we can. And I'm curious, how are you coping with this? I suppose we could call it the new normal. There's nothing normal about it, though, is there? Like everybody else, trying to do the best out of this time, trying to enjoy time for reading, a bit confined, but also I'm personally very much interested in the outcome and I'm working quite bits on on the pandemic, on the development of vaccines, like everybody else trying to contribute to a good solution to this very difficult problem that we're going to have to live with. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that. And and you you were working in terms of looking at a, a vaccine. And of course, it is the number one question that everyone has in terms of when there may be a vaccine and uh, what sort of progress is being made. <laughs> I think it's encouraging, you know, given (laughs) this short amount of time that science had to come up with a vaccine. As you know, there are very types of vaccine. All this is new because the old way to produce vaccine would take much longer. So there are new technologies that have been developed that can accelerate this. So but we first have to see if the vaccine is, you know, functional. Is it safe? Can we scale it up? And can we distribute it, you know, to which is quite of a challenge to nearly 8 billion people. So, you know, those are enormous challenges, but I think I've never seen the science trying to really find a solution in such a small amount of time and really with a real collaboration, at least on the scientific aspect of things. And it is almost a unique situation, isn't it? You mentioned the collaboration. I don't think I've seen anything quite like this. This is a global collaboration, clearly a global pandemic that we're all facing. But this really is laboratories around the world pulling together in a way that we probably haven't seen before. It's the first time when you think about it, you know, the outbreak bigger of the year, and we're already now in phase three clinical trials for with at least four different vaccines. You know, this was just unthinkable. So we have one, the tool, but also the, you know, the will to find, at least on the scientific community, a solution because nobody can hide from this problem. You know, depending if you're poor, rich, extremely rich, you know, we're all the same. We're humans and we have to face with this little nano particles that is really challenging our species. I think it's also put the spotlight perhaps more than ever before on the importance of taking care of our general health. And maybe this comes to the point that we're going to be talking about in terms of your work with Amazentis and our own personal health span and, and longevity. And we've heard so much, of course, about people with underlying health conditions suffering far worse than, than others with COVID-19. And if only, I guess, all of us were in a better state of health, then the, perhaps there may not have been as many people dying from a virus like this. It really does show the importance of, of those those basic things of, of exercise and, and good nutrition. That's for sure. But also, and we see the importance of w- aging well, to some extent, as you've, we know, you know, the popul- the aged population is more susceptible for a lot of different reasons, because they are, you know, affected by various disease and makes them weaker towards the, vi- the virus. So to some extent, we have to learn to live not only longer, but better 
in better health. And I think this is also one of the goal of mission of the new science coming. And that's where Amazentis wants also to try to contribute. Well, that's what I find so fascinating. And uh, let, let's talk about that. And, and for full disclosure, as I mentioned at the start, this podcast is a now a collaboration with Amazentis. Very happy to do that. One of my goals is to help people understand the work that scientists are doing. And uh, I guess from your perspective, explaining your work as a scientist to people, to the masses, to people in huge numbers is a crucial element of what you need to do. Yeah, and I think then uh, scientists have a responsibility, you know, to say what we do, to, you know, advance the science so as to, you know, enhance our capability, our well-being, but at the same time to be truthful and not over-promise things. And certainly when you talk about ageing, you know, we have to be modest about it. But I think, yes, we have made tremendous progress when you look at, you know, we speak about the revolution of uh, IT, of information technology, of biotechnology, but probably the biggest revolution we've ever seen is the fact that we have double life expectancy over four generations. For our species, this is just incredible. If we would have told our great-great-grandparents that we would live twice as long as they, they would have thought. And I think we're probably on the way because we start to understand the molecular basis of the aging process to be able to, you know, uh, in fact, not make us a turtle, but, you know, gain above a couple of generations is something that you could imagine. But it goes also with a lot of social responsibility because, you know, we use as a species, we used to live over three generations. We're starting to live over four generations. But what will it be? you know, to live maybe over five or six generations. So yes, the science is moving. We have to start to prepare our species also to the social acceptance of living longer. And for this, one of the most important things for me is the quality of life. It's not only the time, you know, how much, but can you live with a great quality for 80 years? That was nearly unthinkable, you know, four generations ago. I am personally 65 now, but I don't feel like an old man <laughs> so at all. But probably my great-great-grandparent <laughs> was feeling an old, a really old man. So we've made a tremendous progress. The key question is, can we do the same thing for another generation or two? And that's where the science is probably at the time where we start to be able to act on it and really, you know, have a true science-based impact on the process of aging. And meaning good aging, meaning, meaning that, you know, you would be in, be in good health as you were in your 40s when you were in your 80s. That's really the challenge. Yeah, and you've really gone to the heart of the matter. And uh, I guess the issue, as we are able to live longer, it isn't the focus on lifespan, but we want to be, as you use that phrase, not to feel like an old man, maybe at 80 years old, to, to continue with those healthy years, the health span, as we now describe it. And then maybe a few short months where we deteriorate and finally die, but we don't have that prolonged period of ill health before we eventually die. And that's the biggest challenge, you know, is the quality of life. I think it makes no sense, you know, to increase the lifespan if it is not with the quality that, you know, we all want to. And there are a couple of things that we do care a lot. When I say what is good aging, you know, I see four things. First is your mobility. You want to be independent. The second thing is cognition, of course. This is extremely important. You know, you don't want to, to, to forget who you are and, and, and your family and so on. That means being hit by dementia. The third thing is vision for me, because this is part of our life, to be able you know, to continue to read, to be part of the world. And of course, hearing is also very key. And you see when people have a hearing and eyesight problem, they start, you know, their quality of life diminishes quite significantly. So for me, those are the four criteria. If you think about, you know, acting on aging that we have to keep in mind is mobility, cognition, hearing and vision. And to keep in mind the fact that these uh, different aspects of our lives, our physicality, they are all, indeed all connected. And uh, people often focus, I think, on, let's say, their diet for their physical ability to walk or to run or to bend over or, or to lift something. But uh, as you, you correctly say, our eyesight, our ability to hear, our mental capacity, all linked to how we treat our body in terms of 
diet and nutrition. Yeah, that's what we learn more and more. And, you know, there have been a lot of studies uh, from diet and what we call the Mediterranean diet, which, you know, you find in Greece and so on. That's where a lot of, there are a lot of spots, several spots where people are, uh, you know, are known to live quite a long time, up to 100 years. The centenarians, you know, are, so for example, in Greece, there's a small island in Greece, and it looks like, you know, diet is key. And, and that was the whole purpose of, of Amazentis, to try to understand, uh, you know, what were the ingredients in this diet that was really acting at the cell and molecular level on the aging process. And this is a new science. We knew that we, we know that diet is important, but can we try to get the active component in this diet so that we could, you know, take them as supplement uh, because not everybody can live, you know, in the southern island of, of Greece with the right olive oil, the right fish, and the right vegetables. <laughs> and I think this was you know, what drove uh, Amazente science uh, when it was initiated. Well, exactly. I wanted to talk to you about that and, and how you founded the company. It was 2007. And, and what was going through your mind at that stage to, to form a, a company like this, was there a, a big idea in your mind? You know, I'm a neuroscientist. I've worked on uh, neurodegenerative disease uh, for all my life, um, mainly Parkinson and Alzheimer. And I've been on really, I would say, the high tech part of it. Uh, and, and I do remember reading an article on superfruits. To be honest, I was quite skeptical because I'm the typical, you know, a molecular scientist that if you don't understand exactly the mechanism, they wouldn't. And I had a postdoc at the time that came and said, you know, I found uh, there is an article saying that in pomegranates, there might be something. And we had the Alzheimer mouse in a laboratory, which is a transgenic mouse that reproduces disease. And she, you know, we've decided just to give some pomegranate extract to really see if what we were reading was true or not. So again, as a scientist, I was extremely skeptical. <laughs> and we found some, you know, early indication that there might be something there. And that raised my, you know, interest and was asking myself, can we try to deconvolute? So at first I did a lot of reading on pomegranate. It's very interesting that, you know, it was identified already in the 15th century as the fruit of youth. So, you know, our ancestors had identified this fruit as a very a key, you know, a, a part of diet that was related to kind of anti-aging. But no real science was made on it because usually when you try to deconvolute, that means trying to find the active ingredients in something as complex as a fruit like pomegranate. It's very rare that, you know, you found, you, you're able to find the molecules. Anyhow, to make a long story short, we thought it was worth it. So, and then we decided I had already built uh, two other biotech while I was in the States. I was for, what, nine years at Brown University. So I knew a bit what, you know, biotech was, how to put a company together. And with one of my old graduate students, uh, who is now the CEO, Chris Rich, we decided, you know, a bit, <laughs> it was a bit crazy, but to say, why don't we try to do, because this was seen as soft science, nothing serious would come out of it. But I thought it ought to be done. So we've convinced some, um, you know, uh, uh, major business angels to invest in our company, in this, you know, but we had really an intuition, nothing more, to be honest. And again, it took quite some time. And, you know, you have to be a bit lucky in science. <laughs> but then we found, in fact, we were able to identify a molecule called urolithin that is not, you don't find it in the pomegranate, but if you eat pomegranate and you have the right microbiome, that means the bugs that are uh, colonizing your guts, it transforms those tannins into this molecule. And fast, in a very interesting way, this molecule activates what we call mitophagy. Mitophagy is the process to rejuvenate your mitochondria. And the mitochondria are the small organelles that you find in your cell that produce the energy that the cells need, called the ATP. That's the energy of the cells. And this urolithin is able to stimulate the rejuvenation of those mitochondria. 
So it is not the whole process of aging, but it's certainly one very important one. Because when you age, you dimin- the, the number of mitochondria in those cells diminish, they're less functional. And when you're able to induce again this process, you are rejuvenate and produce new mitochondria that provides the cell the energy that it requires. So you know, but that took, to be honest, 10 years. So it's not something that you know you do just in six months in the laboratory. And very carefully, we've looked at it first in vitro, cultivating cells, then in small little worms that we call C. elegans, then in mice, and more recently in humans. Clearly, this is very exciting science. Just going back a little bit, I'm curious to know when you realised that there was something to this, when in those early days you looked at pomegranates, you knew the history, you knew the stories, but you didn't have any sort of scientific proof about how beneficial they could be for us. Uh, That must have been quite a, a light bulb moment for you in your mind. Quite exciting. And we'll continue this conversation in just a moment. Hey, quick question for you. Are you someone who wants to be fit, healthy, and happy? And what if I told you you could get your dream body by simply just listening to a podcast? I'm Josh. And I'm KG. And we're the hosts of the Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast. Listen, we get it. Fitness isn't easy. Carbs, no carbs. Just stop, okay? It doesn't have to be that complicated. And that's why we made this podcast. We get straight to the facts so you can become your best you. So the way to check us out is click the link in the show notes or search Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast on any of the major podcast platforms. We'll see you soon. Yeah, because, you know, you suddenly you found, you know, because there's no molecule that we know that can induce this process called mitophagy, rejuvenation of mitochondria. And here were, were we, having identified the first molecule that could do it. And, you know, and it came indirectly for pomegranates. But now we realize that not only pomegranates provide, but, you know, for example, nuts, uh, berries, and so on, contain those tannins that are, again, transformed by your gut microbiome and your bacteria into this urolithin. But what we found, which was also very surprising, is not everybody has the capacity to produce this urolithin out of those fruits. We believe now that the, the current scientific evaluations is about a third of us uh, have the capacity to really transform efficiently those tannins into this micro, into this urolithin. But the other two thirds, we can drink and eat as much pomegranate, blueberries, nuts. We don't produce these molecules. So, the, and that came the idea that we needed to, to synthesize it. And then, of course, if you take it, if you admit it orally, uh, then you have you know, you ha- you will have the benefit of this molecule urethane, despite the fact you have or not the right bacteria in your gut. That's a very important point to make, isn't it? That while we talk so enthusiastically about pomegranates and perhaps other fruits as well, that not all of us can benefit. That's right. So only a third of us, and even for we've started to realize during our clinical trials, to get the amount that you need. You would, for example, have to drink uh, between 1.5 and 2 liters of pomegranate per day if you have the bacteria. If you don't have it, you won't produce it. And to be honest, it's quite of a challenge because, you know, uh, uh, pomegranate is okay maybe (laughs) for a small amount. But I don't think that uh, there would be many people that would be able to swallow, you know, 2 liters of pomegranate juice per day. So I think, you know, this is also the other part of, of the equation. So we had to find a more efficient way to uh, get this urolithin into our cells. And that's where we were able to produce us, to synthesize us. And you could take it as a supplement or now we're working also in a regular uh, pill. The point that you make there reminds me of the beneficial or potential benefits of drinking red wine, that realistically, to get the some of the known benefits from red wine, we'd have to drink a tremendous amount of it. That's right. That was the first molecule that was discovered, of course, resveratrol, yeah. which is an interesting molecule, much less efficient than your lithium. But however, and I love, you know, I'm... 
I'm Swiss, Swiss French, so I love great, good red wine. <laughs> but you know, you, I think we made a calculation that we would have to drink between eight and 10 liters per day. And I can tell you, <laughs> you know, your liver would probably not like this a lot. So I think, you know, I think we, that's why we have to go through the supplement route if we want, you know, to benefit from those molecules. And that's why you need biotech companies, you know, identifying the active component and, and providing them in a way that is easy, you know, to take on a daily basis. And what you're talking about now is a pure, an extremely pure form of urolithin A. That's right. You know, it's like a, a normal drug. So it's, it's a chemical molecule, you know, with a little bit of excipients and so on, so you can swallow or we put it in the supplement, you know, so that it's, it's also a nice experience because, you, you know, as we do this, we didn't want this to be a, a, a drug like this, but it should be a real experience. Now, of course, I am in Switzerland where we started, uh, you know, the Nespresso, for example, coffee, the way to do it. So it should be, you know, a nice way to, for me, it's, it's associating, you know, something nice to, to take while benefiting it. Usually drugs are, you know, not that nice to take. We, have, we take them, we swallow them. But for us, the idea was, can we try to pro- provide, you know, the pleasure of something to take that is good for you because often when you take things that you like are not necessarily good for you or at moderate level but obviously you shouldn't you know uh, uh, exaggerate so for us in the philosophy of amazentis that's also very important is the experience the you know to have pleasure with the experience of taking a molecule that is good for you and in amazentis terms this is what you call mitopure that's right. That's the name that we gave to the urolithin. Urolithin is the is the chemical definition, and Mitopure is the is the brand of the molecule because this was the first time that it was identified, you know, and and it will be uh, now present in the various uh, ways. It could be a supplement, it could be a smoothie, it could be a pill, and some people prefer to take it with pills. I don't, you know, tend to like to swallow pills. I'd rather have a pleasure of, of, of putting something in a nice yogurt or in a smoothie. So again, I have the impression that it's good. It's good for me, but it's good for me for the long term. It's good for me now because I enjoy taking it. And do the beneficial effects, are they immediately obvious to people or this is more likely clearly something is going to take time we are talking about longevity benefits after all that uh, perhaps you you take the supplement today you're not going to necessarily notice anything tomorrow so you know and certainly not gonna, it takes time to see if we will have an effect on longevity <laughs> for, for our species <laughs> but i think what and that's why we've concentrated our clinical trial in 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 some in in trying to see if something could be seen and could be measured at a reasonable amount of time. And one of the first things, you know, that degenerates while we age is the muscle, you know. We lose uh, muscle strength, so we tend to not walk as much. So, 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 and our first clinical trials were really geared at trying to quantify if by taking this uh, uh, molecule, we can increase, you know, the muscle, muscle activity, which is related to mobility. And that's what the first clinical trials have shown, is we're increasing what we call the six-minute walk. And you calculate how much you know, a walk you could do in six minutes, and you could see. So that will not take uh, you know, two hours, but over several weeks, we see already an effect on your mobility and your capacity you know, to walk. And I think this is very important. So we also probably think that it has also an effect on cognition and so on, but that would be take time to see. But what we're doing, we have an, really an anti-aging molecule. There will be se- several of them because there are several ways to tackle the problem. But first is, you know, this energy will be provided to all your cells. So the easiest to evaluate is the muscle function. It's um, easier to, do, to look at the cognitive, but I'm totally convinced that it's probably also very good for your cognitive function because we know in the brain, I'm a neuroscientist, that of course the brain is affected, you know, the same way. And the brain needs a lot of energy. In fact, it's the organ that, you know, uh, consume the most. So I think it will also, and of course the hearing, the vision, because it's a whole process. So probably all your cells need to have more energy while we age or go back to normal energy. But the one that are the easiest to evaluate 
uh, we thought was the muscle, uh, you know, and mobility. And that is why I, I make the connection to longevity, perhaps at a, on an individual basis, because frailty is often the beginning of the end for so many people. I mean, quite simply falling over because pe- older people don't have that muscular strength anymore that could ultimately lead to the end of their lives and perhaps a, a premature end of their life. It's exactly, you know, that's one of the key things is that you, you don't have the same strength, you tend to fall, you break your hip, you go to the hospital and, you know, and then you start, it's very difficult to recuperate and this is the beginning of the end. So I think having, you know, muscle strength is key in your ability to move and to move safely. And that's why we put a lot of uh, emphasis in this first component, because you can quantify it, but also we know in terms of the quality of life, it's an essential component. And of course, your ability to move gives you the independence that we all enjoy as long as we can. And I think that's why uh, this was the first uh, uh, thing that we want to prove scientifically, that this urolithin can really do something on your muscle function. Just going back to when you formed the company, which you called Amazentis, was there a reason for that word? Can you explain why you gave the company that title? Yeah, at the time, because, you know, we, people spoke a lot about uh, super fruits. So, you know, you say pomegranate is one of them, but there are a lot of very interesting fruits that you find in the Amazon, <laughs> acai and so on. So people are, have looked and there are a lot of smoothie that are now given. Unfortunately, they don't have the science behind, but we know that a lot of those fruits grow into nature, in the, into the Amazon. So we were inspired by the Amazon. And at the time, I was I had a, done a trip in the Amazon and saw a couple of those fruits that I have never seen before. I said, maybe there are some very interesting new fruits that have a new molecule that we would be interested to try to find. And that's where the, world, uh, the word Amazentis came, even though now... Uh, you know, we have concentrated our work on on the pomegranate, but I think in the future it's very much thinkable. At least I am interested to lo- to look beyond pomegranates. Can we identify other molecules that have also, you know, a, a synergistic effect on slowing down the aging process? That's fascinating. You have had a, a very varied career, haven't you? You're a neuroscientist by training. You're a medical. Doctor, you're now working in, amongst other things, cellular biology. You are a strong proponent and advocate for a multidisciplinary approach. Yes, and, you know, I've always been, you know, I was trained as, as a medical doctor, but in neuroscience, you're very much exposed to a lot of technology, engineering. It's a, it has a system levels. You know, it goes from robotics to artificial intelligence. Uh, and I like, I, always, I was always fascinated by the convergence of technologies and I was, I'm very curious by nature, and I'm not afraid of looking at a new concept, but I'm very, very keen on doing it, you know, the scientific, the deep scientific way. And I think that was one of the motto, it's one of the motto of Amazentis, you know, is to keep the quality of the science. It has to be science, you know, based and clinically proven. And this is, you know, for us, the real part of and this, I can only do this because I'm, I'm a scientist. And then I run a university. I was president of one of the big uh, two uh, Institute of Technology in Switzerland. And before, I, as, as I told you, I was at Brown University on the faculty of science. So, you know, how scientists work, you know, it's, it's by uh, evidence. And, and, and the quality of what you do is key. You know, I could never promote something I don't believe and we wouldn't have proven scientifically. So for me, this, of course, that would, you know, affect my reputation and I've worked for 60 years. So I would have never done this without the kind of rigor that we've put. For example, in the clinical trials, we run what we call double blind. And the same way you try, you test a new drug. That means you have people, you know, that take it, but the evaluator, neither the person that takes it nor the evaluate knows if you are on the active component or uh, just a placebo that doesn't have the active compound. And this is the way of science. And this is, by the way, the same way that we're now testing new components new to, for, for the COVID. And, and you know, and, and this is this kind of, for me, the scientific rigor was key 
in, in, in its key, it's at the heart of Amazentis philosophy. And that scientific rigour, I think, is more important today. It's always been important, but it's more important today than ever before when we live in this world of so-called, and I hate the expression, but fake news, when people can look at the internet and not quite know what to believe. And that's really the, 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 the real problem, you know, because you can see everything. And I said, we said, at the end, it's the reputation. So the whole idea that we, you know, we're scientists. I was trained as a medical doctor. So this has to go to a certain way. That's the way we, we, you know, prove that something is efficient or not. And for me, it is unthinkable to do it a different way. So I think in all this kind of, yes, there's a lot of charlatan things and so on. So for us, you know, it's to go back. Yes, by the way, there are components in fruits, in natural. By the way, a lot of the drugs are developed, you know, from natural compounds. But I think the, the, the way to do it is so important. And I think that's the whole thing that we want to do it, you know, and that's why we've put so much uh, emphasis. It took a lot of time and resources to prove it. But hopefully, you know, this would be accepted by the medical community because this was proven by the regular ways that science move. And for us, I think for the whole team, this is, this is the way. Uh, it's the only way we could do it. And for me, when you're talking about aging, it's very important. You know, you, it, it would be criminal to promise things that we don't have. So, so yes, and I hope I, I'm convinced that this molecule has an effect. For how long, for the thing, you know, I, we don't know yet. But now, for the first time, you know, we have a molecule that really has a real impact on the aging. Now, I don't know it's going to give you five, ten years, you know, only time will say. But this is a new science that is coming, and I think we have to do it with the same rigor as we do it for the general, I would say, uh, pharma development. That's almost the irony of longevity research, isn't it? You say only time will tell to some extent in terms of the long-term benefits, and that's just the very nature of studying ageing. That's right. But at the same time, you could try to find surrogate, like, you know, if we can show that, uh, like we did, that by taking this, if you have you suffer from frailty, and you could do 300 meters over six minutes, but by taking this molecule, you go to four or 450, you've proven that you've had, you know, that you were able to reverse at least one component of your aging process. Now, and knowing that this, this molecule acts on all your mitochondria and all your cells, you could deduct that it's probably also good for cognition. And that will take time to prove, and that will what Amazentis will do, is that this molecule is also active in cognition. But at least on one aspect, we have something very firm, and that's why we've chosen the muscle function, because it's useful, it's a real you know, good indicator of your aging, but on this one, you don't have to wait 20 years to see if it has an effect or not. You mentioned that you worked here in the United States at Brown University, and I'm just curious what you learned from the American way of doing things, and perhaps the American psyche, I think, must have been quite different to what you were used to. Yeah, I came as a naive postdoc, a Swiss postdoc to the United States, you know. Um, I was given the possibility, because I came with a grant from the Swiss National Science Foundation to go to Harvard, to MIT, but I always liked good place, but that maybe a smaller, that you had a little more freedom to do whatever you wanted. And Brown was a perfect place. It's a liberal, co a liberal college university of great quality in a great place, uh, Providence, that I really enjoyed. And you know, it was the land of opportunity. I came as a postdoc, and I guess, uh, um, what, six years after I was... Uh, or a tenured professor, and I was the chairman of a, of, of, of a department. This is unthinkable in Europe. So there's this kind of, you know, the sky is the limit, which is fantastic. In fact, the first company I did, uh, I do remember so vividly, uh, it was on a Friday evening, somebody knocked at my door, and I saw a person coming in, you know, telling, um, telling me I've read a lot of things you do, I want to do a company with you. And I said, a what? I didn't know what he was talking about. In fact, the gentleman called Mark Levin is one of the great venture capitalists now in the United States, started a big fund called Third uh, Rock Venture in, in Boston. And that was his first company that he was doing. So I've learned by, you know, by osmosis. I had no clue. And five years after, we were on the NASDAQ for an IPO. So I had a crash course. This would have been unthinkable in, in Europe, certainly at the time. 
But this is the wonderful thing about the U.S. You know, everything is possible. And that's what I love. So I owe a lot to the United States, you know, about, you know, not being afraid if you have something that you think is, is important to try to make it. And that's what, I, what I've learned. Me too. I've lived in California since 1996 and noticed and appreciate exactly what you're talking about, that sort of ethos of that can-do mentality and that uh, if you think you can't do it, or actually if you try again, you probably can do it or there's someone who's prepared to collaborate with you to make something happen. That's right. And, and, and forgiveness if you didn't succeed the first time, you know, uh, th- this is guy. I was lucky enough because, you know, it worked. <laughs> so we did an IPO and so on. But, you know, I, I think and that's what I tried to bring back to Switzerland because I love this is my country. It's my, those are my roots and so on. Uh, so, so, but I think we were uh, rather timid. I think we've learned and I think, but again, and I think that's, so, you know, something so key about specifically if you're young and ambitious and have ideas, you don't have to wait for your boss to, to retire to do something. The U.S. allows you, you know, you give freedom to young, fi- in, in, in the academic system, to, to, to young and you have to prove. You know, uh, you, you're going to have, you yourself, you by yourself, let's prove me that you can do it and you can be promoted. And that's why, you know, in no time, if I would have been told that six years after I was chairman of the department of an Ivy League school, I would have never thought it was un- unthinkable. But that's why this land of opportunity that, you know, and this ability to accept and I hope, you know, foreigners to integrate them and so on. I just hope that this will continue over time. But that's a different issue. Yeah. Do you, I, I certainly believe this, that uh, thanks to the internet, which clearly wasn't around in, in your early years and, and mine either, that uh, it has made the world a smaller place in many senses. It is easier, like you and I right now are communicating, we can see each other actually as we're recording this interview, which would have been unthinkable 20 or 30 years ago. It is a smaller place and perhaps some of that can-do attitude of America is maybe filtering through a little faster to other parts of the world? Yes, and I think very much so. You know, we're becoming, a, as we say, a small village. Uh, and, and I think this is, this is v- v- very obvious these days. And during the COVID crisis, you know, we were able to continue to interact, to work with our colleagues around the world, which would have been unthinkable. But think, without this, how, you know, we were writing letters at the time. <laughs> no, just, you know, it would have been just impossible. So this is the beauty of what technology can bring you today. And, 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 but at the same time, you know, as a neuroscientist, our brain is changing. It's an evolution of the, 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 the human species is not a fixed species. So it's evolved with time. But again, we owe a lot, you know, to the United States. It was interesting at the big, before the world war, it was Germany, Europe, and then the, the leadership came to the U.S. God knows, you know, science, you know, I always say that science was, uh, communication of science before the First World War was done in German. Now it's in English. Maybe in 50 years it'll be in Chinese. I don't know. But the world is evolving. But I think because of this, we are, and I think the COVID crisis is a good example. Despite of the politics, you know, the scientists work together because we have a common language in science. That's what is so beautiful about science because the law of physics are the same in Beijing, San Francisco, or, or Geneva. And I think we're starting with those tools to share a community, but also a responsibility as scientists, because science has never been as fast, probably, as now. And, but also we have responsibilities about the application. So even in the field that we work on, on aging, of course, it'd be fantastic if you could slow down dementia, Alzheimer, and so on. But also we have to be careful that we don't produce people that have lost their minds and live at the expense of society. So I think there's a responsibility of science that is coming over the years that is very important. But that's why it's so fascinating. And I think we have to learn also to speak about that, you know, to express our doubts, our hopes, and share it. Because otherwise, you know, society will not follow. I'm still, you know, flabbergasted that there's so many people that are against vaccines, that again, that are creationist. That means as a scientist, we were not able to communicate. So we have to learn how to do this, even in the fields and not overpromise things, but really come up with the rigor of what we think, which has been until now, the best way to do it, which is the, you know, reproducible experimentation paradigm 
that scientists have developed over the, dec- the, the centuries. And with Amazentis, that's exactly what you've been doing for these past few years, that rigorous scientific process. And clearly in 2019, with the publication of the, the first human clinical trials, that was a, a pivotal point for the company. And you really are now at, at quite a, a key point moving forward. You might have been delayed a little bit because of, of COVID, as everyone has with just about everything we do. But the next few months are going to be quite interesting, aren't they? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, we first published the thing in the top journals in the Nature family. Uh, uh, so because we wanted to have this rigor, now we also had the because yeah, I think it's important the the pleasure part of the the experience is important. We've packaged the way that it does look like a drug that we would have you know to swallow uh, painfully. But uh, and now of course this is the time. But again, we can start to do this despite COVID because, you know, we can do the kind of thing. We can talk through the world, throughout the world. We will start in the United States because, you know, also I think this is an important market for those kind of things. It's also an important that the, you know, that the FDA, you know, was involved in the process. And we also want to have, you know, the rigor to saying this needs to be safe. This is probably the first and most important thing. So, uh, and we're hopeful that hopefully people will, will, will see the effect because we strongly believe that we can help people because at the end, you want to help people, you know, as we've said, to live a good life as long as possible. So, to, you know, to increase the quality of life so that the experience while we're on this earth is an enjoyable one. And you mentioned the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. Maybe just for listeners to this around the world, explain the significance of the FDA being involved. Now, of course, because, you know, uh, the FDA protects, you know, the consumers from, you know, false claim and also, you know, things that could be dangerous for your health. So for us, it was very important to go what we call the grassroots general guard of safe. That means we have, we've sent a dossier to the Food and Drug Administration so to ask them, you know, if they thought we could proceed with this. The FDA has looked at it and think that this is safe. This is extremely important for us because, of course, primum non nocere, the first you don't harm, that's what we say in medicine. And, and for, for us, it was extremely important to have this kind of, you know, label and then been overseen of the, you know, FDA. And we would do the same thing in EMEA, which is the correspondent of the FDA in Europe to do it. So, we, you know, we, we, we're going to work. We're very ambitious. We want, you know, uh, th- this product to be bought by people because we believe it's a good one that would help them. But we will want to do it again the same way with the rigor that we want even from the, you know, the regulatory agencies. So for us, it would unthinkable not to work very closely t- with the FDA to promote uh, our product. Let me just ask you in closing, and I often ask scientists this same question, really, looking at your body of work throughout your career and everything that you've learned, what is it that you apply to yourself and your own way of life now with your own longevity or your own health span in mind? If there was something that you could pinpoint and say, yes, I know that and I know that to be crucial and it's something that uh, I live by every day, what is it? No, it's it's funny because through the COVID, you know, also, you know, while I was president of university, you have a very busy life. It's hard to do exercise, the amount of that. So now I had a little more time. So I've started really to exercise, you know, two hours a day by just walking because we're have the pleasure to live in a gorgeous scenery and so on. So, and, and to think, because, you know, this is a great thing I've never had before, is the diet. You know, I'm trying to, to, to now uh, be much more uh, respectful. But also it's difficult, you know, to respect everything. So being helped by a molecule like your lithium is key. Uh, and that's why, you know, to be very honest, uh, I was very keen and I've been now there for nearly three months on your lithium. So, you know, I walk the talk. For me, it's very important that, you know, because I truly believe uh, in, 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 in this molecule. So for me, it was very important to, to be the first customer. But I found this also a pleasure. And of course, for us, it's wonderful because, you know, this is the results of 30 years of studies, you know, from when I've started as a medical doctor, as a neuroscientist, because we haven't proven yet in neuroscience, but I am hopeful that we will see also an effect on cognition. And of course, as you age, to be honest, the most precious thing that I have that we probably all have is our brain. <laughs> so I, that seeing the effect in humans on the muscle, I'm even more keen about taking this to try to protect my brain. And I have nothing to lose because I know that this molecule is extremely safe. 
And looking forward, I often wonder why people aspire to reach not necessarily a super great age, but uh, we talk a lot about health span, maybe from a a spiritual perspective, apart from the physicality of being healthy when you're older, which we've talked about, but just being an older person and still being aware, still being connected, still being involved in life. Is there something, again, that you can pinpoint that you aspire to? Yeah, and I think, the, of course, you know, you want to, you know, I'm, I'm a sort of an artist, um, and my father, you know, lived until he was 90 years old, but uh, um, and he was a painter. And, you know, artists are wonderful because they don't retire at 65. They continue. And what is the most probably important part of our brain is our creativity. And uh, when you look even in the history of music and so on, you know, you look at Richard Strauss or painting and so on, you have a lot of, you know, uh, very, uh, you know, some of the most important piece of work were often done when those artists were very old. So I think this part of it and the most precious part of it is our creativity because it expresses who we are as human beings. And for me, that's probably the most important thing is to keep this enthusiasm for life, this creativity, this ability to contribute. And of course, for this, you have to have good cognition. You have, again, to have good mobility. It's better you know, to have good hearing, even though Beethoven, while he was deaf, was still able, but he was a genius. <laughs> and Degas, uh, you know, a painter, was able to, to sculpture while he lost his, his vision. But those are exceptional people. For more regular people like us, I think as much as you have the sense to have a life that is meaningful, the better it's going to be. And of course, and that's why, you know, I've, if we could contribute a little bit to that, I will have the impression that we did something useful. Patrick Evershire, this has been a hugely enjoyable conversation. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And over the coming weeks, we'll be hearing from some of the other researchers who are looking at this fascinating field of science. We'll also explore more about the science behind MitoPure, the pure form of urolithin A. We'll hear some of the scientists who've spent much of their lives working to understand the importance of mitochondrial health and muscle strength as we age. And if you'd like to read more about Dr. Ebisch's work, I'll put some details into the show notes for this episode, and you'll find those at our website, llamapodcast.com, Llama being our acronym, Live Long and Master Aging. This episode of the Llama Podcast was brought to you in association with Amazentis, a Swiss life science company that's pioneering cutting-edge, clinically validated cellular nutrition under its timeline brand and if you enjoy what we do you can rate and review us at apple podcasts you can follow us in social media at llama podcast and you can direct message me at peter bose many thanks for listening health optimization is what this podcast is all about and that means taking care of our mitochondria, the energy centres of our cells. Physical strength, avoiding frailty, is key. And that's why the science behind urolithin A and the work of Timeline Nutrition is so interesting. You can find out more and get a discount code at our website and in the show notes for this episode.